Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Uh, we have been uh, studying some of the things in the book of Romans. And uh, we're going to go to Romans 4. And, uh, but let's go to Romans 5 first. Mm -hmm. And uh, here Paul kind of points out our problem and then the solution. See if you agree. In verse 12 of chapter 5, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because of all, all have sinned, that's our problem. All of us have sinned. Back in, in Romans 4, verse 25, it reads thusly. See if this is, a pro is the solution. He, Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Wow. Seems like the problem is solved. Yeah. Last week, if you were with us, you notice we talked about Romans uh, 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 3, verses 25 and 26, a great deal about why Jesus had to die, and apparently uh, suggesting that God was, was uh, trying to tell us something, trying to demonstrate something, trying to teach us about his righteousness. He says three times that God's righteousness was revealed through what's happened there. There's a very interesting relationship between Romans 4.25 and Romans 1, 18, 24, 26, and 28. I'm going to take just a moment and look at that. The word here in verse 25, Romans 4.25, because of our sins he was, my version says, given over to die. Norm just read delivered, is paradidomy. What does paradidomy? It means to hand over, to give over something. And it turns out that there's nothing in the original Greek about dying. It just says, because of our sins, Christ was handed over. Well, we, for John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it, when Jesus left heaven mm -hmm. to do what is teaching down here on this earth. Yeah. So, handed over. What's, what's well, we go back to Romans 1. It says God's wrath is what? Being his handed. giving up. His handing over exactly the same Greek word, all the wicked people. Uh, verse 24, God, so God gave those people over. 26, because they do this, God has given them over. Verse 28, because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, he has given them over. Well, what happens to people when God gives them over? If Jesus was given over, what happened to him? He died. He died. He died, so it's not wrong to say he was given over to die, but what did... How, how did he die? How did he die, and what was his response? Separation the father from the never, you know, The father didn't touch his son, because God had been accused of, well, you step out of line, God's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Well, the worst thing he said, or the, the thing that was bothering him the most, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Really? And he didn't say anything else about any other mechanism of death. Mm -hmm. So evidently, God forsaking is a mechanism of death. Or God paradidomi, turning you over, is a mechanism so of Romans death. So Romans 1 says God handed him over. Um, no, God, Romans 1 says God's wrath is his handing people over. Yes. Romans 4.25 says he handed Jesus over. And Jesus said what in response to all that? My God, my God, why have you? 
handed me over. Handed me over, basically. Why have you abandoned me? Could we say that that's a proper definition of God's wrath? Better than that, is that God's mechanism of death? Is that the mechanism by which the wicked die? Mm -hmm. Or you could say, could you say, let go? Mm -hmm. Could you substitute the phrase, let go, instead of uh, hand it over? Now, this is particularly important for Seventh-day Adventists who say that our message to the world, our final message to the world, is in the three angels' messages, Revelation 14. And over there, it talks a lot about wrath and fury. Could it be that the correct interpretation of God's wrath found here in Romans 1, Romans 4, and Matthew 27, 46 is that God lets people go. He hands them over to reap the consequences of their own bad behavior because there's nothing better he can do. It makes no difference. Either model, they're just as dead. Yeah. But the difference is God's role. Yes, exactly. Does God let people go to suffer the consequences of what they've chosen for themselves, or does God punish them with death? Which is right. Which is right. Which is the right way. Is, which way shows that God will always do the right thing in all circumstances? Which is the way that tells the truth about God's character and his government? Yeah. And all through the Bible, I would suggest, all the way from Numbers to Deuteronomy to Judges to lots of places through the Bible, it says basically the same thing. And if you would like to get more information about all those places, we don't have the time to talk about them now, but if you go to our website, www.theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, you can find materials that talk about this. Go to the handouts for those very books, especially look at the handout for the book of Judges. And there's a great discussion about God's wrath and what the Bible says. So we should not make the mistake of we want to understand wrath and the Bible, go to Webster's Dictionary. We need to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about God's wrath. And then put that in when we read the third angel's message. And we'll get a very different picture of God. Guess what? That's a revelation of the righteousness of God that Romans is talking about. But now, where, what's the point where he does give them over? I mean, isn't there, isn't there going to be, there's going to be a point, I mean, the fact that he's keeping them, hasn't given them over yet, keeps them alive, right? Mm -hmm. So when is the point where he finally gives when God, over? When God recognizes that there's nothing more he can do. When people have irrevo irrevocably made up their minds about God, and so that means that at the end of time, now the people who are dead, they've already made up their minds. There's nothing, they're not going to change anything. They're already dead. But the people who are living on the earth, there's going to be certain events. We don't have time to talk about those now. But there's going to be certain events that cause people to look at the issues and make up their mind, and God is going to finally say, okay, I'm drawing a line in the sand here. Whose side are you on? Are you gonna, do you believe this or do you believe this? Who do you believe is telling you the truth, etc.? And every human being apparently will make up, their, make up their own mind and God will say, there's no reason for me to wait any longer. People have made up their minds. These are people on my side. Those are people on the devil's side. It's all over. So will these people understand that if they go across this line, they're going to be let go? Well, and, that, that's, and on this side, they're going to they're going to stay with him. And, that's what and, we're supposed to learn from the life and death of Jesus. And then we, if they know that if they go across the line, that's pretty incredible that they're going to do that. Mm -hmm. If they know they're going to be let go, that they're going to die. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is that a lot of people are afraid of God because they believe He's the one that's going to zap them, or He's going to throw them into hell to burn forever. None of those pictures are correct. Or purge them for a period of time. Yeah. If Jesus died the death of sinners, did he burn? Is he still burning? If the death of sinners is eternal fire, Jesus must be still burning. Well, we don't believe that. We don't believe he burned at all. Yeah, but so, doesn't, doesn't it sound like these people that are going to die forever is that, are actually choosing to do that? Yes. They're choosing to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's why? all this? 
But why? Because they have developed a character through their lifetime that is in rebellion against God. And once that character is developed, there's nothing anybody can do about it. Even if they were put into heaven, that character wouldn't change. It would start the great controversy all over again. And so it can't happen. And I think we should keep in mind, too, though, another point, that we're talking about the final death of sin and mm -hmm. sinners here. And there's an awful lot of death uh, that occurs described in the Bible that is not this one at all. There are three kinds of death described in the Bible. We usually talk a lot about two kinds, but there are actually three kinds. There's a spiritual death. We don't talk much about that, but the Bible describes that. There's physical death, which we all are very familiar with. We see people dying of physical death all the time. Mm -hmm. And then there's the final, ultimate, eternal death, the second death. And Jesus is the only one who's died that death so far. Now, at the end, the wicked will die that death. Jesus died the death of the wicked. And uh, so those are our choices. But it, it's still pretty incredible to think about this. Um, yep. What's God is not still not even saying that, hey, you're across the line, you're going to have to die because, because if you what? don't, the great controversy is going to start again. What but God is, you know, what it's God almost is like they know that too. Yeah. And possibly whenever knee will bow, they'll know mm -hmm. that there's no other way for them. What's actually happening here is God would say, who do you trust? Would you rather do what you want to do, which is basically what the devil did? Are you going to follow the devil's example, or are you going to do what I want you to do? Are you going to trust me? Are you going to believe that, are you going to believe that all the instructions I've given through Scripture, are you going to believe all the, you really believe that those are the best way to do things? Do you trust me, or do you trust yourself? Do you trust the devil's way? That's the choice. Will I do it my way, or will I do it God's way? Every day we're making that choice. It, that's the point. Yeah, every day we're making that choice. And Ken, isn't, <clears throat> isn't that uh, part of a contract, a, a covenant? We agree out of faith we're going to follow. Mm -hmm. So if we're not part of that contract, part of that covenant, mm -hmm. am I pronouncing this right? Paradidomy? Paradidomy. So we're handed over, not necessarily killed, but we're handed over to the side that, that we choose. We, we actually choose our side. So by faith, just believe in God, follow God, understand He's love, and then we're on God's side? Well, Paul suggests that it's not just believe. He's suggesting that having faith in God makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. Well, let's go back to Romans 5, and let's look at a couple of other things in that, in that chapter. Look at verse 9. By his blood we are now put right with God. How much more, then, will we be saved by him from God's anger? Now, we've been talking about that. Here's Paul talking about it again. What does it mean to be, uh, my version says, put right with God? Uh, by his blood we are now put right with God. How does Christ's blood put us right with God? Well, we got to we talk at once, huh? You got <laughs> righteous, the righteous covering of His blood, His pure blood. No, we're what covered does in blood it. mean? That's what life. I mean. Why are we talking life about that blo blood? That's where the life is. Why, why even bring up blood? Okay, because it is a symbol of death. And what that says is his life was given to us and we get to look at it. And he was faithful to that until his death, the blood flowed. That's a, just a symbol of talking about his life as it pertains to us. Well, I think blood could also mean commitment, well, couldn't it? Because remember, remember what, uh, when God went to Abraham and they made the covenant mm -hmm. and they separated the pieces of, animal. piece of the animals and the blood was in between mm -hmm. type of thing. Well, it doesn't isn't blood kind of kind of the 
the last thing you can say that of commitment that if I don't do something you can kill me? Well, let's think about this. The ancients had no idea about the circulation of blood. They just realized there are certain places if you get hit. But they know when they die, it's usually all over the place. Yes, that's exactly right. What they discovered is if you start seeing the blood come out, it's all over. (laughs) It's all over. That's what they understood. You see the blood come out, it's all over. So losing the blood means death. That's what they understood. Uh, You know, believe it or not. We understand that too. It still works. Still works, yeah. (laughs) And it was only a couple hundred, two, three hundred years ago we discovered that blood actually goes around in a circle and comes back again, you know. Right. <laughs> discovered all the business about circulation. So that's what they understood. So when it talks about blood here, it means blood given in, in sacrifice, is, 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 it causes death. So, um, you don't think it has anything to do with a blood oath? I, I doubt it. I mean, maybe. Maybe you haven't thought about it enough. Well, that's possible, too. (laughs) Okay, I'll just... Well, Romans 5 tells us that just as Adam's sin caused all of us to to be sinners, how does that happen? Well, Romans 12, verse 12 says, it's because we all followed Adam's example and do our own sinning, right? Uh, In the same way, Christ's death makes it possible for all of us to be saved. How does that... Excuse me, how does that work? Do the first half of the equation first. Okay. If, if when they chose Satan and transferred their faith and love, their connection with divinity which they had to have to live was broken and there was no mechanism by which they could get it back. Mm-hmm. Nothing they could do could get that back. Mm-hmm. And so they were doomed. Every last one of them, from Adam straight on, none of them had the ability to get that connection with divinity. We don't have. We can't live in the Garden of Eden. We had. We don't have access to the Tree of Life. That's right. But Jesus came mm-hmm. as a representative of all humanity, mm-hmm. and he had that connection, mm-hmm. the divinity human connection, and he demonstrated that that was valid. That, that with that connection, humanity could do exactly as God had asked them to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when we see that, he offers that connection to us again. Mm-hmm. When we put our faith and love back, he says, I'll give you the connection, just stay in touch. Yeah. Well, Satan said that it would never be possible for a human being to live a perfect life here on That's this earth. That's what's... Christ disproved. And he did. He, Christ did it, and Satan was disproved. Once again, I mean, if we had a chance to look at all of Satan's claims, Ellen White talks a lot about Satan's different claims. Look at every one of Satan's claims, and God just disproved, 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 right down the line. Yeah. Okay, well, look at Romans 6. In Romans 6, we see uh, Paul talks about what happens to a people. How, how do you get started over with this, this new life? And he says, it's by baptism. What happens in baptism? So, well, look, look at these verse. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to live in sin so that God's grace will increase? Now, if God's grace just keeps increasing to cover all our sins, you might say, well, let me sin more so that God's grace will do what? Increase, yeah. right? Certainly not, Paul says. We have died to sins. How then can we go on living in it? For surely you know that when we were baptized into union with Christ Jesus, we were baptized into union with his death. By our baptism then, we were buried with him and shared his, shared his death in order that just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might live a new life. Paul is saying that there is no way Mm -hmm. for Christ to substitute for us without our death. Okay. We have to die to self, totally give up Mm -hmm. on it. It's an old man that has to be buried. Mm -hmm. And then we can have newness of life from him. So there's no such thing as humanity getting to heaven without death. His death. Yeah. 
or or, or our, uh, well our death, our death, our death. So that mm -hmm. become we become it becomes permanent. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that some churches now just use sprinkling, and some churches use pouring, and a lot of people don't bother with baptism at all. Now, which is right? Do we? What does baptism mean? I don't want to spend a long time on this, but the word baptism is what you do with the dishes to the Greeks. You put them under the water, you scrub them with soap and water, and you pull them out again, right? And that's not a, con that's not a contested matter. Uh, a very interesting and famous uh, translation of the Bible, right here in this verse, Romans 6, 3, in a footnote, done by two Roman Catholic Jesuit scholars, said these words. St. Paul alludes to the manner in which baptism was ordinarily conferred in the primitive church by immersion. The descent into the water is suggestive of the descent of the body into the grave, and the ascent is suggestive of a resurrection to a new life. How could you say it better than that? Yeah. Well, so we don't have to argue with our friend, other church friends who might be, have a, a different kind of baptism. There it is. So. Uh, Death, burial, and resurrection in the water baptism. There was a, uh, a gentleman who was going to be baptized, and uh, he made the announcement that uh, that this that he recognized that this was a death of the old man of sin, and he asked the preacher, "Hold me under for at least ten seconds, because I want to make sure he's really dead." <laughs> okay. Very good, okay. Well, I want to move on to some other verses. Uh, look at Romans 6, 14. Now, this has been used along with um, a couple of other verses, Romans 10, 4 and Colossians 2, 14, to suggest that, you know, we, we, we don't need to obey the law anymore. Look, at, I'm going to read them those three verses from the King James versions, Version. And, and then I'm going to look at, read it from my Good News Bible, and then we're going to discuss it. Romans 6, 14, King James Version. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And Colossians 2, 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, isn't that sufficient evidence to suggest that we don't need to bother with the law anymore, the Jewish law, it's given different names, the law of Moses? Uh, Read the second one once more. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Stop right there. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Okay. Trying to get righteousness by the law. Okay. Doesn't, Doesn't work. work. Doesn't, Doesn't work. work. You know, it, it depends what you believe the, the law did at the, in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you believe that that, if keeping the law actually saved you, well then um, that would be different than if the law actually led you to God. I mean, those are two different ways of looking at it, and you're going you're gonna to react to this differently. Okay, listen to my Good News Bible. I'm reading the same three verses. Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under the law, but under God's grace. Romans 10:4. For Christ has brought the law to an end, so that everyone who believes is put right with God. And then Colossians 2:14. He canceled the unfavorable record of our debts with its binding rules and did away with it completely by nailing it to the cross. <clears throat> Phillips did a marvelous job on Romans 10, 4, when he said <clears throat> something like this. I don't know the exact, I'm not quoting the exact words, but he says, Christ is the end of the law as a way of being saved. Yeah. That's, That's what it's it. talking about. And the Jews absolutely were determined, the Pharisees especially, and Paul was a leader of them, said, so help us God, we're going to keep this law and we're going to be saved by keeping the law. And that was never the role of the law. What is the role of the law? The law is a mirror. It, it points us, we look in the law, we see, oh, I made a mistake. That isn't the right thing to do. Let me go a different direction. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Those are God's directions. And it, the law functions very well as a mirror. But it's not any good as soap, it's not any good as water. 
It, it doesn't clean up the mistake, it just points out the error. You gotta do a 90 degree turn and run to Jesus for all of that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. The, the <laughs> law, Jesus is superior to the law because he wants to save us. The law, the only thing the law did was show us that we were sinners. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, was if the law was, if the law, if Jesus was the end of the law, well then that's, you got to put them all in a package, actually, to get that whole idea. We're going we're gonna to get over to Romans 13 a little bit later. It says, love is the fulfilling of all law. If you do away with the law, there is no such thing as sin. Mm -hmm. Because the law defines sin. Mm -hmm. Do away with it. You do away with sin. You don't need Christ as a, a, to, to solve your problem. And well, so to, to think that you can do away with the law and still retain Christ as a redeemer is an oxymoron. Well, think about the contrast between law and grace. Law is, for example, demanding, exacting, exposing, accusing, unforgiving, provoking, irritating, unyielding, impersonal, and it leads to rebellion. But is that the fault of the law? No, that's what the law is supposed to do. The law is perfect, Psalm 19, 7. The trouble is that we are rebels. We are sinners, but sinners that we are, what we need, when we see God as He is, infinitely gracious, then we realize that grace, that's God's graciousness, is giving, forgiving, covering, persuading, very personal, and it wins us to repentance and faith. Pretty, pretty amazing when you contrast those two. So that's what we're supposed to learn about the law and its relationship to grace. Look at Romans 6.23 in the minute or so we have before our, before our break. A very significant verse, and my version says, Romans 6.23 at the end of that chapter, um, for sin pays its wage death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. What are the implications of saying sin pays its wage death? It isn't God that does it. No. Sin is the Lord does it. Does you end. What? It wasn't God that killed Jesus. Sin killed Jesus. Jumping over the cliff will pay a wage. Yeah. Uh, some people talk about the leap of faith. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> no, I'm talking about the sudden stop at the bottom <laughs> is the result of the, of the leap. I see. Okay. So we need to understand very clearly that there's a, there's a very significant flip that needs to be made in our thinking. So often we're afraid, we're surrounded by sin. We become very comfortable with sin. We like sin even and we're afraid of God. We need to change that upside down. We need to say, we're comfortable with God, we like God, but we're afraid of sin. Yeah. That's the change that needs to happen. And that's what happens when you're on God's side. We need to be comfortable with God and scared to death of sin, because sin does what? It Deadly. pays its wage, death. So if we don't want to go that way, then we need to ask ourselves, okay, how can I get to be on God's side? Can I understand his character? Can I understand his righteousness? Can I trust him? And if so, I can avoid that penalty of, of sin. We'll be right back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're looking at the book of Romans, as, as you know, and we got down to the end of chapter 6. In chapter 7, Paul comes clean, we might say. He says, you know, I've been talking about all this wonderful stuff that God does for us, how gracious he is, how kind and forgiving, etc. But the truth is that what? It's not easy to stop sinning. Look at uh, Romans 7, and, and let's start with verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am a mortal, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do, but instead I do what I hate. Since what I do is what I don't want to do, this shows that I really agree that the law is right. So I am not really the one who does this thing, rather it is a sin that lives in me. Now Paul is, is doing something here that we might have a little trouble with. It's almost like there's two people fighting inside of Paul, right? I know that good does not live in me, that is, in my human nature, for even though the desire to do good is in me, I do not, I'm not able to do it. I don't do the good I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I do not want to do. If I do what I don't want to do, this means that I'm no longer the one who does it. Instead, it is the sin that lives in me. Now, when I read that, I'm reminded of a small boy who was fighting with his brother. He was kicking and, and beating him, and then finally spit on him. And at that point, Mom says, okay, that's too much. And he says, Sonny, don't you know that, you know, it's the devil that wants you to do that? It must be the devil's idea that made you do all those other things. And the little kid says, well, maybe the kicking and the beating were the devil's idea, but the spitting was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's the problem. We want to do it our way. We want to, we want to think for ourselves. And, and, and we can. We can if we realize that God's way is the, is the right way. All we have to do is, see, God can only admit to heaven people who don't even want to do what's wrong. If you don't want to do what's wrong, it's perfectly safe for God to admit you heaven. And that's what the 10th commandment is all about. So Paul goes on here to say, so I find, this is verse 21, Romans 7, so I find that this law, I find that this law is at work. When I want to do what is good, what is evil is the only choice I have. My inner being delights in the law of God, but I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against the law which my mind approves of. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. What an unhappy man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is taking me to death? Thanks be to God who does this through our Lord Jesus Christ. This then is my condition on my own, I can, serve only, I can serve God's law only with my mind, while my human nature serves the law of sin. Here Paul refers to sin not just as an act, but as a condition. Mm -hmm. And for that's that disease, that condition, only Christ uh, can bring the healing that we spoke about earlier, the salvation. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a good thing. It, yeah. it's, it's really... So is, Amazing. is um, what's the difference between a lost sinner and Paul? Well, because they're both sinning, it sounds like they're both sinning. Yeah. But maybe, Paul, maybe Paul is kind of having a metamorphosis there where he's trying to, to divide himself out. He, he uh, doesn't want to be a sinner. He doesn't want to be a sinner, but yet he keeps sinning. Well. And, and he actually talks about that earlier in chapter 7. Let me look at those verses. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. Remember we talked about the law being a mirror? It's law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not said, do not desire what belongs to someone else, what, where, what, where is that in the law? The tenth, tenth, tenth commandment. commandment. That's the Tenth Commandment, others. yeah. I would, not, I would not have known such a desire. By the way, we're reading from uh, chapter 7, verse 7, yes. from there on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but by means of that command, sin found its chance to stir up all kinds of selfish desires in me. Apart from the law, sin is a dead thing. Now think about Paul as a Pharisee. You know, he knew all the rules, he knew all the ins and outs, he knew which, 
ways to get around this rule and ways to get around that rule. He knew all that stuff backwards and forwards in his earlier days. And he said, I know exactly what I need to do, da 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 and all the parasaical rules. But then he read the Tenth Commandment, and he started thinking about the implications of that. And it made him angry. Why did it make him angry? He said, God now is not only requiring right action, he's requiring right thinking. God's messing with my mind. He says, my mind is my own property. Stay out of it, God. Leave me alone. I'll do what I need to do. I'm following all your rules. Don't worry about that. Now, this is in the days when he's a Pharisee. But then he thought about it again. He says, apart from the law, sin is a dead thing. I myself was once alive apart from law. That was his Pharisaical days. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. And the commandment which was meant to bring life, in my case, brought death. Sin found its chance and by means of the commandment, it deceived me and killed me. So then the law itself is holy and the commandment is holy, right, and good. And so what is Paul really saying? What Paul is really saying is this. Would you want to admit to heaven anyone who thought it was all right to break any one of the, of, of the Ten Commandments? Absolutely not. No. Why not? Well, we don't want to be around people who lie and cheat and steal and slander and covet and start the whole great controversy all over again. God and blasphemy God and yeah. set up idols to worship other than our Lord himself. Well, if you're talking about the 10th commandment, you're you're kind of saying that the first 9 can be faked on the outside. They can on you the can outside. you can look like you're keeping the first 9. But the 10th commandment says that the inside has to be pure. Absolutely. So so Paul is saying, what, what Paul is saying here is he's saying, I'm thankful that God will only admit to heaven people who don't even want to do what's wrong. And did he reach that point yet? I don't think he did, did he? Well, I mean, he, that's he, his point, isn't it? He recognized that truth. He recognized the truth. Yeah, and okay. that's what we need to recognize. And that's why he said, thank goodness for Jesus, because he's done it for us. God's our grace. Mm -hmm. His grace. The, the issue is how afraid of sin are we? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not so much. I mean, because we're told that the closer we get to Jesus, mm -hmm. the more sinful we'll, see, we'll feel in our own, in our own, about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that, that may, and that, I guess that's why Paul can come and say, I'm the greatest sinner of all, because he was getting relatively close mm -hmm. but so many times we, we we tend to use it as an excuse that we'll see sin in ourselves and then kind of say oh well if it's going to be there there's nothing I can do about it and so I just won't worry about it but we're surrounded by so much sin in the world it comes to feel like it's normal yeah but we it, it should scare us to death yeah absolutely well, Paul's response, of course, to Romans 7 is Romans 8. And it starts out with those marvelous words, there is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life in, in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. And if we drop down to verse 3, he says something very significant. What the law could not do because, of human, because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature, that would be in the human life of Jesus, by sending his own son, who came with a nature like our sinful nature, to do away with sin. To do away with sin. And then he goes on to talk about the members of the Godhead, all three of the members of the Godhead. And what does he say about them? Uh, look at... Uh, Verse 26, in the same way the Spirit, this is chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, in the same way the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. So who's on our side? The Spirit. The Spirit. And if you go on, it, it seems to suggest that the Spirit helps us to know, to pray, to be honest when we pray. And then 
We know, look at verse 28, we know that in all things God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. So who else is on our side? We got the Spirit and now we got God. Now we got God the Father. Those whom Jesus had already chosen, he is also set apart to become like his son so that the son would be the first among the many believers. Certainly we don't think Jesus is against us. He said he'll be with us forever. Mm -hmm. So how many members of the Godhead are on our side? All three. All three. So, Spirit, Father, and Son. So he goes on then in verse 31, in view of all this, what can we say if God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right side of God, pleading with him for us. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? As the scripture says, for your sake, we are in danger of death at all times. We are treated like sheep that are going to be slaughtered. And then his marvelous conclusion at the end of chapter 8, No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am certain, now remember he was certain back in the beginning about God's righteousness, wasn't he? In Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you just make that simple and say there is no sin that can separate you from the love of God or change God's opinion? That's so right. people who are feeling sad, lonely, depressed, uh, overwhelmed by their own sin, they should not be afraid of God. They should not be afraid to come to God, talk to God, pray to God. Mm -hmm. Even though there are sinners. Right. Mm -hmm. And there, it, it looks like the picture I get from this is a sinner that is struggling to shed this sin, but he can't do it. Mm -hmm. But yet, um, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit stay with him. Mm -hmm. So you've got this picture, and that's the difference between the other people, is that they're not trying to shed this sin. There you go. And they're not trying to, um, they don't value the, the Father, are. Son, and the Holy Spirit. They, they they're really rebelling good. against him. They aren't willing to let God work in their lives, yeah. actually work in their minds. Yeah, they're, they're actually rebelling. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then most well, of that's a volitional decision. Yeah. It's not a coerced or out of ignorance. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're comfortable where they're at. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens next is, is something quite remarkable. In the first eight chapters of Romans, Paul has set forth what he believes is the plan of salvation. And he set it forth for the benefit of who? Everybody. Everybody. But in his audience there in Rome, who are hearing this for the first time, there's a certain group who have some objections. And who are they? Oh, the brethren. <laughs> <laughs> the former Jews, the ones who had a background like Paul's background, who felt like, hold on just a minute. We want to be saved because we're descendants of Abraham. We want to be saved because we keep the law. We want to, I mean, you said that there's advantages in being, the Jew, uh, being a Jew. We, we, we were given the scriptures. Don't we have any advantages left whatsoever? And so Paul says, okay, it's time for me to stop all that talk about the plan of salvation for a moment and focus on my friends, my fellow countrymen, the Jews. And go, he goes on here, I'm speaking the truth. I belong to Christ and I do not lie. My conscience ruled by the Holy Spirit also assures me that I'm not lying when I say how great is my sorrow, how endless the pain in my heart for my people, my own flesh and blood. So then he goes on, if we had time to read chapters 9, 10, and 11, and he says, I would be willing to die myself if it would save them. But of course that doesn't happen. But Paul goes down and he says some very interesting words. How do you explain this? Look at verse 10. And that is not all, for Rebekah's two sons had the same father, our ancestor Isaac, but in order that the choice of one son might be completely 
the result of God's own purpose, God said to her, the older will serve the younger. He said this before they were born, before they had done anything, either good or bad, so God's choice was based on his call and not on anything they had done. As the scripture says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. So that should settle it once and for all. God makes a decision before we're born, finished, right? <laughs> Well, there have been some pretty prominent theologians that take that position. Yep. Yeah. What's wrong with that position? Doesn't that seem to say that? Well, if you have a little knowledge of the Old Testament, this shouldn't be any problem at all. God spoke to Rebecca before they were born. He said the older will serve the younger. He was just looking forward. He knew exactly what was going to happen in the lives of these two young men. But when was it that he said, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau? That's from the book of Malachi, and that was written hundreds of years, something like 1,400 years after Esau and Jacob were dead. <coughs> so God is just saying, look, I said this back at the beginning. Look, what is the result? This isn't God saying, I decided I like him and I don't like him. No, God is saying, I said at the beginning, because of the way they live, you know, this one's going to be good and this one's not going to be so good. And what's the conclusion? Malachi tells us. But I, I think it's, it, would be, it wouldn't be damaging to say that God loved Esau with all of his heart, mm -hmm. but it sure pleased him a little more when Jacob came around. Yes. So really, this is a chance for us to see that in the Bible when it says hate, in fact, Jesus himself talks about hating your father and your mother. You know, if you, if you, if you love them more than you love me, you're in trouble. Your wife, your children. Okay? God says, Jesus is saying and Paul is saying here, hate just means to love less. That's all. He loved Jacob more because Jacob was more willing to listen to God. He was more in line with God's will for his life. So God hated Esau. It just means he loved him less because Esau didn't respond to God's love. Or he's talking more about a plus and minus yeah. instead of an absolute contrast. Right. Yeah. Well, in chapter 10, he, he, he says the same thing. My friends, how I wish with all my heart that my own people might be saved. But then he says something interesting down in verse 17. How do you understand this? So then, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through preaching Christ. Faith comes from hearing the message? Why did he say that? Well, he was writing letters that were to be read. Okay. How many people could read in those days? Very few. Not that many. So when this letter came to Rome, someone who was educated much more than the rest would stand up with a scroll. It was probably 15 or 16 feet long, and he would open it up. He would roll the two things out. Okay, here's the beginning. He would start reading, and as he would go along, he would have to do the, the roll up one, unroll the other, and roll up one, and keep going like this. And that's the way people learned. They, they had to learn by hearing it read. By, and that's why it says over in, in Revelation, now, blessed is he who reads out loud. And it's literally reads out loud the message of this book. Well, in chapter 11, he wraps up his discussion about, uh, well, for the Romans and how he feels about that. And he says, you know, it's like a tree. You might, some, tree, some limbs might be damaged in the tree. They might be torn out. And they, and they might be lying on the ground and they might look completely dead. But, God has a chance, has the opportunity to pick up. In fact, God even can take limbs from a wild olive tree and, 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 and graft them in, just like he brought the Gentiles into, into the Christian church. But don't, let the, don't think for a moment that means he can't graft in the original branches back into where they belong, just as he could save Jews who are willing to accept his message. So then we come to um, chapter 12. And Paul, up to this point, has been talking theology. He's been talking issues and so forth like this. And now he says, okay, in chapters really 12 through 15 or really 12 through 16, let's deal with some practical issues. What 
difference does all that mean? Or what difference does all that make in our lives today? And he starts out by saying, So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is the true worship that you should offer. What does that mean? A living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. They were accustomed to giving what kind of sacrifices? Dead ones. Dead sacrifices. Right. Paul, and Paul's saying, and, and with God's inspiration, he's saying, I don't want dead pigeons anymore. I don't want dead lambs. I don't want dead kids. I, I want live people. What does that mean? I mm. want people dedicated to me with everything they've got. And people who are living and active and, and, and breathing and not, not dead, lying on the ground. I want people who are willing to serve me and serve me in the best possible way. And they are, therefore, what? True, living sacrifices. True worshipers. Right. Living sacrifices, true worshipers. The next verse says how it happens. Mm -hmm. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly. Now, we've said that already a number of times in our last couple of sessions. Who does the changing in our minds? God. It's God. But what be do we be transformed. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We exercise trust in God. We say, God, I need, to, I, I really want to be changed. I really understand, what, I mean, I'm beginning to understand what this is all about. Please change me. I'll read my Bible. I'll try to understand you. I will appreciate what you have done. You make the changes in my life. But it, it uses an interesting word at the last of that, in the last yep. of that, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect mm -hmm. will of God. Mm -hmm. That's what the transformation is supposed to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, the rest of, of uh, well, and, and let's talk about that for a moment. There's, there, there's an, another part of this we need, to, we need to talk about. What's the difference between a living sacrifice and a dead sacrifice? That might seem like a funny question. Amount of blood on the ground. Amount <laughs> of blood on the ground. The living well, sacrifice yeah. bear fruits. Yeah. Something is alive that can do something. It can change. It can, it can witness. When you sacrifice something, when you kill it, it happens in an instant. Mm -hmm. Whereas a living sacrifice is a continuous sacrifice a good point. as they're living. Mm -hmm. So, good point. So, Seventh day Adventists, and we are among that group, um, have had a great emphasis over the years on the health message. Does that have anything to do with living sacrifices? What do you think? Well, it helps you live as long as you can. <laughs> okay. That's for sure. Is, is that the important issue here? Well, notice what else says. If you're one of these living sacrifices, what do you do? You can truly worship God. The purpose of a health message is not so that, okay, we can, we can just be dummies and, and just, okay, here I am. No. no, the purpose of the health message is so that we can think clearly about what? About God. So we can understand what we're reading in this book. That's the purpose of the health message. It's not just so, you know, as Gary suggested, maybe we live a few years longer. That's nice. That's great. But the purpose, the real purpose of the health, health message is so that we can be living sacrifices. We can people who... who, who live lives that are true examples of how God wants us to live. As we follow Jesus, and Paul, by the way, says that over in 1 Corinthians, says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know. there's, there's an interesting thing, though. As we get involved with sin, mm -hmm. our capacity to understand God and to understand things that are spiritual decreases and decreases. The transformation, though, can once again increase the capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, clearly as we fill our minds full of the right kind of things, then that's what our minds are full of. 
Yeah. So it's good also, um, you know, live a good, healthy, clean life and uh, think clearly, spiritually, mm -hmm. but also to be able to um, spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. And this is somewhat unrelated, but, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for all the folks around the neighborhood. This particular city that we're in is known for longevity, and we have many in their 90s and hundreds and and uh, just today I went to um, repair, uh, pick up my son's cello mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that the gentleman has taken good care of his health. It's a non-spiritual issue mm -hmm. but he's 92 years old and he's a master violin maker and, and uh, cello repair and all this and, and uh, I'm just so grateful for the people around town spiritually who take care of their mind physically who take care of their bodies, uh, they're really able to share in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel that this is a very good thing. And not only do people live longer, but they live healthier mm -hmm. that period. They're in less pain. They're more and, joy. And the point is their minds work better. That's, that's a good point because <laughs> I've seen a lot of people get so wrapped up with this health stuff that's all I think about is the health stuff and they, the point where they start studying the word uh, becomes secondary. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to go too far on that. <laughs> well, the health, health by itself is not the goal. Mm -hmm. the, the goal is by living healthier lives, we can think more clearly about God, we can represent God better to those who look on. That's right. Yeah. Well, we have been in our last couple of sessions have been working our way through the book of Romans. We've got a little bit left and we'll have to do that next time. Paul in the first eight chapters of Romans has talked about his version of the plan of salvation and he spelled it out and he said it's available for everybody. In verses 9, I mean sorry, in chapters 9, 10, and 11 Paul says, I know that my Jewish friends, my, my, my brethren and sisters by my own kinship weren't happy with this message too because they thought they had an inside track. But God's message is for them also. Anyone who wants to listen is welcome. And so we would extend that invitation to you today. We'll see you next week.